Welcome to the 2021 virtual NDDOT Construction and Project Development Conference. This is the fifth in the series of a seven week session. I'm Megan Eisenhower from the Williston District. Today's presentation will be on US 85 and the Long X Bridge, and it will run about an hour and a half. Questions may be submitted in the chat and will be answered at the end of all the presentations. Our first presenter today is Matt Linneman. Matt Linneman is the Materials and Research Engineer for the NDDOT. He has previously served as a Project Manager for the development of the US 85 Environmental Impact Statement. Matt? Thanks, Megan. <clears throat> yeah, welcome everybody today. Uh, today we want to tell you a story, a uh, project delivery story about uh, US Highway 85 and the Long X Bridge. So starting about with the environmental clearance for the entire um, corridor and then getting into the design and construction specifics of the long axe bridge segment um, presentation is broken into th three major segments so that's how we want to tell our story here is going in depth into the, the 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 considerations with the environmental uh study and clearance that was done and then like i said diving a little bit deeper into the the badlands long axe bridge area of the design that was done in that area and then a little bit even more specific with the construction of the, the Long X Bridge and, and Wildlife Crossing. Let's get started. Let's get you oriented a little bit. This project is in Western North Dakota on US Highway 85. Uh, starts at I-94 at Belfield, uh, up to the south end of Watford City, ties into what we always call the Watford City Bypass, where the four lane section starts there, uh, travels through um, <clears throat> the communities of Fairfield and Grassy Butte crosses the Little Missouri River. That's where the Long X Bridge is located. Um, we also have that extended development in the area, you know, south of Watford City, as well as a little bit north of Belfield. Um, <clears throat> a little bit more detail into the project setting. Um, this is situated in that western North Dakota, you know, rolling hills, grassland landscape with some intermixed croplands. We have the Badlands segment for uh, about eight miles of the project uh, through this reach um, adjacent and running through the National Park, the North Unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park for about two miles. And then also adjacent to US Forest Service property uh, interspersed throughout the project, um, uh, the national grasslands of the Little Missouri River. So talking about the environmental document, we're going to break this down into three different pieces. We're going to talk about the, the proposed project, uh, the stakeholder engagement process that we went through, as well as the environmental impact statement as a document itself. So a little bit backwards than what the actual process is to do this, but it maybe takes a little makes a little bit better story as we're trying to do today uh, as far as telling you and getting you oriented with this. So the proposed project, basically this is the outcome of all of the different um, major activities that after all the alternatives analysis was done and vetting through uh, you know a lot of work which we'll, we'll talk about kind of at the end but this is kind of what the outcome was through all of that work and so every good project we should start with why are we doing it what's the purpose what's the need for the project so um, it was categorized this way in the environmental impact statement as far as trying to meet the social demands the amount of traffic that was out in that area, the mix of traffic, um, development of oil and gas uh, in the region, population increases, agriculture, and, and plenty of public lands and recreational use out in the area. System linkage being, you know, the the famed um, uh, figure eight config configuration of four lane across the state of North Dakota. Um, this is kind of what the missing link, if you, as you can see, the yellow being our four lane network. This link here connecting the four lane piece of Highway 85 with I-94. Uh, safety, obviously safety is always top of mind when we're here at the DOT. Um, one of the number one pieces of public input we got, um, although a lot of our you know, traffic crash analysis and, and things like that don't point to a lot of an overabundance of, of issues and safety issues, the number one piece of input we got um from from the public was near misses there's a very limited amount of good passing opportunities on this segment of road and any number of people could give you stories about being run off the road uh 
on this segment of roadway. Uh, capacity, just meeting the level of service demands that uh, we're looking for out in the future, looking you know, to a 2040 projected level of service and that once again, those limited passing opportunities, we were going to see you know, significant decreases in level of service for traffic. Um, the classification of this roadway being on the national highway system, being a interregional corridor, uh, you know, as as designated by the North Dakota DOT. It's also a nationally delegated high priority corridor for the movement of freight and goods and also part of the Ports to Plains Alliance, uh, looking for a connection, you know, across the United States to um, Canada and Mexico. This segment being part of the Theodore Roosevelt Expressway. <clears throat> Some of the other needs out there, this is a Badlands it's kind of an oblique view of the Badlands Long X Bridge area. You can see those shaded reddish areas of historic landslides in the area. So obviously an unstable uh, piece of uh, geology out there in the Badlands and uh, a tricky place to build a highway. And then also a lot of because of those same Badlands, those ideal um, ecological habitat that uh, is along the corridor, uh, you know, the whole way. Um, not just the Badlands, but but everywhere along there, but coming up with ways to, you know, minimize animal animal vehicle collisions as well as provide connection to habitat on both sides of the highway without it, it becoming a barrier. So of that, we're trying to meet all those those needs and balance the solution that we need. So the ultimate decision here was to expand the to a four lane roadway section. So in this typical, you can kind of see the uh, the existing roadway over here with a little bit of expansion to get the shoulders in that we need and then our kind of typical 84 foot median um, to center line to center line with the new roadway section so very similar to what us highway 83 um, you know between bismarck and minot is so with that that was a general alternative selected but we wanted to make sure we we're utilizing flexible design options so that we can um, try to make this fit in the context where where the context changes. So here's one good example of that flexible design options. This is um, near the north end of the north unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park looking south. This is an existing picture out there, but you know, trying to fit a four lane section in here and trying to minimize impacts to the national park. We exercised the idea of a, a little bit lower speed limit and a narrower median. So as I advance the slide here, you'll see a simulation of uh, you know a flush median design through this area to try to balance you know the the need for the highway capacity and the impacts uh, to the surrounding uh, land use. Uh, another safety feature here, one of our major intersection with North Dakota Highway 200, about in the middle of the project corridor. Uh, several different options looked at for this intersection and. Uh, ultimately selected a, a roundabout. The unique feature here is that this would be a, a two lane roundabout um, for the, the two lanes of through traffic. So that would be uh, a first in the state of North Dakota uh, on, the, on the state highway system. Um, obviously, we're focusing a lot today about Long X Bridge and we, we vetted through several different alternatives on, on that, but uh, essentially the decision was made to replace the bridge and uh, and here's a quick existing picture, I would say, uh, of the bridge before it was demoed now. And then at the time of the development of this, we had a, an artist rendering of what that would look like in the future. So as we get into the design and deta uh, design details and construction details, you'll, you'll see some real pictures of, of that. Uh, landslide mitigation, like I said, there's lots of unstable ground out there in the Badlands. Uh, one of the major features that we were looking at is the Horseshoe Bend area, which that, that we call, which is uh, about a mile north of Long X Bridge, um, right adjacent to the North Union of the National Park and looking at a structural type of solution there to uh, a pretty large landslide that, that's been active over time and trying to um, put a, a final stabilization uh, solution in place there. Uh, lots of input from McKenzie County and uh, Watford City area to have a trail that could connect uh, closer to the north unit of the National Park with, uh, you know, a potential expansion of the Watford City trail system. So uh, potential shared use path uh, trail um, out in the potential in the back slope or on the inslope of the of the roadway. Uh, like I said, that ecological connectivity, so a wildlife crossing system um, through the Badlands was kind of where our target area was. 
Uh, so exclusionary fencing um, to keep to minimize that animal vehicle collisions, but also then providing conveyance uh, for wildlife uh, under the roadway. And we'll hear more about that as we move move forward with the presentation as well. So stakeholder engagement was one of the focal points of the the environmental process because there's so many different interests in this in this area and such a long corridor that it, it traverses many different interests. So the different stakeholder groups that we worked with, um, we had obviously this was a federal undertaking. So Federal Highway was our lead federal agency, uh, the DOT being you know the lead agency and the owner of the project. Um, we had uh, contracted with KLJ to help us do all the work on this project and they had a team of about six other consultants that helped pull all the work together for this environmental document. Uh, with that, we also had uh, the National Park Service, the US Forest Service, and the US Army Corps of Engineers um, as uh, cooperating agencies. That uh, the reason they're cooperating is they, they added a, a stake in the project and the fact that they would have to issue some sort of approval, whether that's uh, permitting or uh, land use type of approval uh, for the project. Uh, with that, we also had lots of committees and, and groups that we coordinated with the Tribal Consultation Committee, uh, all the cities, the counties and communities along the corridor, all the landowners, many special interest groups that are interested in the, the natural and um, uh, wildlife and um, wild aspect of that uh, area, especially in the Badlands. Uh, we have a historic bridge, um, all the different wildlife that we've talked about in that area and many utilities, lots of utilities that parallel the corridor potentially impact. And so, we had many different coordination meetings with all of these. We had kind of our our standard um, environmental document, environmental process, public meetings that that were required, but it was it was identified very early on that was not going to be enough. So we we pulled together lots of different stakeholder meetings. Um, we recognized, you know, after our first round of public meetings, that we were missing a, a whole aspect of the public in the middle of the project in the Fairfield area. So we pulled together a Fairfield stakeholder group. We also pulled together a stakeholder group that would kind of cross cut all of these other groups and have a few individuals from each of them so that we could really workshop different al alternatives and ideas. Um, we did, you know, created a website, created a, a series of mailings out to everyone to keep them informed of what was going on. So we put a lot of time and effort into public outreach, community outreach and in input into the project and keeping everybody informed of what was going on. Uh, one of the best tools that we came up with was the, uh, the creation of a GIS story map. And this was something that was published out on the project website. Uh, as we started developing this, um, it became apparent that this was going to be a really good tool for people because what we could do is overlay line work. Uh, I don't have a live version here, but basically over here, it kind of works like a slideshow. You can flip through the slides and there'd be text and information about each area. There'd be a waypoint along the project where it, wherever that slide kind of correlates to and would tell you that story. But at the same time, you could dy dynamically um, move anywhere on the map and see anything, skip around anywhere that you wanted to, or you could you know, pick a slide that you wanted to go to learn more about things. Um, the nice thing about it was for landowners is we could overlay the line work of our potential our alternatives as well as potential impacts to right away. And landowners or people of interest could you know, scroll anywhere that they want on the project map and see what the potential impacts were to their to their properties. So it came, became a very good tool. The other nice thing that maybe surprised us was that this was a really good tool since it was an Esri product. Um, it was very well adapted to mobile enabled technology. So if you pulled this up on your phone, it worked maybe almost better than it did even, even on, your, uh, on your computer. So it became a good tool for telling our story. We were also gonna use it to help tell the story when we we're at public meetings, kind of be the, the base of our presentation. But as more and more data got uh, pumped in there, uh, when we had one of our stakeholder meetings, by the time we worked all the way through it, we spent three hours. So it just became it became a great tool, but it was just too much information. And so we we used it as a as a great public outreach tool. There's a link at the bottom of this slide. Once we publish, um, I'd encourage you to go out there and, and take a look at that story map. Um, <clears throat> just to talk a little bit more about um, Long X Bridge and the, the stakeholder coordination on that. You know, the bridge is a historic bridge, like I said, so, uh, you know, characterize the, the style here is a, a subdivided Warren through trust bridge. It was built in 1959. Uh, you know, some of the, the issues here, you know, a 16 feet of vertical clearance, um, even though that's that's 
plenty by most accounts uh, for state highway bridges. The, the lots of large movement because of oil and gas and agricultural loads that need to move through here. Multiple times that this was struck, the cross members and the bracing struck and resulted in closures of the bridge. Um, you know, a, a typical detour route, about 50 miles of indirection. If you know that there's a detour, if there, if you don't, then it's probably even more if you got to turn around. Um, but even so, it's historic property. It was protected under the Historic Preservation Act. It is also protected under Section 4F of the US DOT Act. So lots of consultation, vetting of alternatives. Um, we tried hard to work with uh, our partners at the North Dakota Historical Society, um, with the Tribal Consultation Committee, with the community, with the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, and um, essentially vetting through all the alternatives we needed to look forward to a mitigation strategy and our best strategy for that was to put it up for adoption and uh you know we've had some successful adoptions in north Dakota in the past but those have been small county pony trust bridges that are easy to pick up and move nothing on this scope and scale has really ever been adopted you know and very few even in the whole country but lo and behold we were successful and uh we found a willing landowner and uh he's He's uh, taking ownership of this and plans to put, you know, the south span of this back together uh, down in the Linton area of, in North Dakota. So a little bit more about the, the actual document. Um, like I said, I'm kind of working backwards here, but as we, uh, what is the what is an environmental impact statement? Um, I got some a quick way to tell that story by the numbers, and then we'll we'll get into some of the key environmental commitments that carry through into the construction, uh, the design and the construction, especially for Long X Bridge. So the environmental in impact statement is a it's the highest level of environmental document that we can do and we do these when there's a high potential for adverse uh, effects. Uh, the EIS is here's kind of a I'll read you a definition this might sound kind of weird but uh, an EIS is a full disclosure document that details the process through which a transportation project was developed including consideration of a range of alter reasonable alternatives analyzing the potential impacts resulting from those eternal alternatives and demonstrating compliance with other applicable environmental laws and executive orders. So, like I said, um, what that does is it, it gives us inf an informed document to make decisions from, uh, with Federal Highway being the ultimate decision maker, um, but it, it allows us to <clears throat> analyze those uh, resources along the project that are both you know natural, cultural, and social, uh, assess the impacts to them and and help that inform our design and our decision making. So we did a lot of iterations. You know, it wasn't like here's all the uh, alternatives at the end. Let's pick one that's, you know, somewhere in the middle. We we built all the alternatives to try to balance all that using some of that design flexibility as we went. Uh, additionally, this document also served as a 4F evaluation, like I said, uh, Long X Bridge as well as other historic properties and uh, and some US Forest Service lands along the project were protected under Section 4F, so we did the evaluation of those. And it also served as a document to evaluate uh, the least damaging practical alternative uh, for the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, to help streamline our, our future permitting processes. So not gonna go into a lot of detail about the, the EIS other than I'm gonna give you some numbers and maybe it'll paint a picture for you what it is. And some of this is recap, but like I said, there's two lead agencies, Federal Highway and the DOT. We had three cooperating agencies, the Park Service, the Forest Service, and the Army Corps of Engineers. 17 participating agencies that were involved in the project from other state agencies, federal agencies, and uh, cities and counties. Um, we had uh, 12 plus tribal nations uh, through the Tribal Consultation Committee uh, consulting on this project. 34 different utility companies that we did preliminary consultation of impacts um, and uh, proposed um, potential proposed relocation so we could assess the impacts of all of those and have all of those cleared in the environmental document. Um, like I said, we had a prime consultant in the KLJ that helped us do all of this work and they had six sub consultants to help them do all of this work because it was a, a pretty heavy lift. You know, and <clears throat> like I said, we had a look at different alternatives. We had 46 different alternatives and options that were considered but eliminated through our screening process, which we established a very rigorous uh, alternative screening process that, that took stepped us through several different phases to 
decide which things could be included and couldn't, and then still applied our flexible design options that we could use to avoid or minimize impacts. So that's something that you heard from Chad Orn back, uh, I think on the second version of our uh, presentations, um, talking about making sure we're looking at our, our design and our design options so that we can first look at avoidance, minimization, and then uh, compensation uh, for impacts to our, to our resources. So we try to work hard on that. We, um, we, there was 58 technical documents that were produced for this project uh, between a, a wildlife crossing and wildlife habitat assessment, um, view shed analysis in the area of the national park, um, noise analysis, noise analysis for wildlife concerns, on top of all of your other kind of normal project uh, documents, such as wetlands, um, some engineering design type documents, design assessments, uh, 21 different resource categories that were assessed um, and project impacts assessed about uh, based on their baseline conditions and uh, the proposed project. Uh, 56 project specific comments were developed to avoid and minimize those impacts and mitigate for those. Um, 12 different permits or approvals that we were needed for along the corridor, um, which included uh, about the same amount of uh, monitoring programs and enforcement programs. All this work took about three and a half years and it was summarized, I'll call it, in about 164 pages in the, the main document of the EIS uh, that was written in an 11 by 17 format to kind of help convey the information in a, in a simpler way to the public. And our goal, which we got to, was a, you know, a single record of decision um, from Federal Highway to move forward with uh, the environmental clearance uh, for this project. So of all of that, a few of the, a few of the key environmental commitments and a few that apply to the, to the, the further parts of this uh, presentation, uh, Theodore Roosevelt National Park, as I mentioned many times, you know, work going in adjacent and inside the park. Uh, our main thing there is we wanted to limit physical impacts to the park um, and address some of their issues related to noise, uh, timing restrictions, uh, visual concerns, amount of additional lighting in the area based on some of their initiatives of the dark night sky. Um, and also their sign itself, their entry sign was a historic property that was uh, needed to be relocated. So um, I think we, we accomplished those all pretty well um, and addressed their concerns. The US Forest Service had, you know, it was we're impacting many of their properties. There's lots of biological concerns with uh, sensitive plant species and animal and bird species and some restrictions on timing and uh, avoiding impacts to some of those. Um, Long X Bridge, we talked about that, about the, the mitigation and adoption of the span. You know, when the adoption is something that becomes a little bit trickier as, you know, how do you actually take this apart in a way that someone can inventory it, understand how it came apart and put it back together because it, it's too big of a too big of a thing to move in one chunk. Um, paleo, paleontological monitoring in the Badlands area, areas of lots of areas of high potential for uh, paleontological resources in that area. So we had monitoring that, that went along with that. And uh, and wildlife, like we talked about, trying to create that connectivity. And we're gonna hear a little bit more from Greg Schonert now about the, the wildlife considerations that were taken into account for this project. Thank you, Matt. Next up, we have Greg Schoner. He is a biologist for the Environmental and Transportation Service division in the NDDOT and has been with the department since 2014. He was involved in the development and review of US Highway 85 environmental impact statement, working closely with agency partners and consultants to develop mitigation measures to reduce impact to the project on the wildlife. Greg. Thanks, Megan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to jump in and talk about the wildlife um, portion of the environmental impact statement. Um, as Matt said, you know, it's a very long project, uh, 62 miles from Belfield to Watford City. And as you kind of go north from Belfield, you have a lot of agriculture land, um, pasture, hayland. As you get further north towards Grassy Butte, you get into some rolling hills of prairie and uh, these large wooded draws and drainages. And then get closer to the Little Missouri and there's, you know, the Badlands rugged type habitat, um, river bottoms. So it, a lot of different types of habitat and um, a lot of different wildlife use these habitats. And I thought it was only fitting to have a Teddy Roosevelt quote since US 85 through North Dakota is called the Teddy Roosevelt Expressway. And so here, uh, Teddy's talking about prairie dog towns and he says, 
Around the prairie dog towns, it is always well to keep a lookout for the smaller carnivora, especially coyotes and badgers, and for the larger kinds of hawks. Rattlesnakes are quite plenty living in the deserted holes, and the latter are also the homes of the little burrowing owls. So here's just sitting in a prairie dog town and just documenting all the wildlife you can see um, just, just by observing prairie dogs. So um, Western North Dakota in general, there, it has diverse wildlife and that, that held true for the, the stretch of Highway 85 um, for this project. Um, a lot of, pretty much all of our big game species can be found in Western North Dakota. Um, a lot of small game, non-game. Um, even non-native species, just fun fact of the day, ringneck pheasant, Hungarian partridge, and actually the wild turkey are not native to North Dakota. They've all been introduced over the years. Um, so when you have, you know, this amount of wildlife and different types of habitat, it creates a frogger type situation. Um, when, you, when you go from a two-lane highway to a four-lane highway, you know, you're increasing the distance um, wildlife need to go over the highway, can create avoidance uh, behaviors. Um, and obviously increase mortality. Um, so the DOT, uh, Federal Highway and KLJ, we work very closely with the Game and Fish Department um, um, through the development of the EIS. Um, we developed two, two volumes of wildlife accommodation reports. Um, the first one was basically just kind of describing the, the project setting, the habitats, the wildlife that are in the area and kind of what what's needed to kind of maintain that um, ecological connectivity and uh, reduce overall impacts to wildlife. Um, that second volume kind of got more into the details of, of actually what we were going to do, kind of the, the design and placement of the, the wildlife crossings and kind of the, the estimated costs of, of all the associated items that go with that, the fencing and the jump outs. Um, so we also work closely with uh, U.S. Forest Service. As um, Matt said, there's a lot of Forest Service property along the corridor here on 85. Um, we, they have their own species. They kind of keep tabs of wildlife, plant species, um, raptors. And so we did with the consultant and um, as these project segments kind of get built, you know, there's surveys that are going to be done and, and were completed for, for, the, for this project. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service, we also developed a biological assessment for endangered species. Um, two of the species that were of concern, um, Dakota skipper and northern long-eared bat. Um, so we did surveys for, for those species and also um, migratory birds are also concerned. A lot of different species of migratory birds along the corridor and also bald and golden eagles. Um, National Park Service, they were involved a little bit within the, the development and placement of the wildlife crossings. And then a lot of pu uh, public comments, um, people that were concerned with wildlife getting hit on the roadway as we expand from a two lane to a four lane, you know, these people um, either are wildlife enthusiasts or, you know, they're local folks that travel the road every day. So they know that, you know, uh, animal vehicle collisions are a concern. And then also several special interest groups or NGOs um, express interest in the project um, regarding wildlife. So every, uh, every problem has a solution. We knew going in, um, there's gonna be impacts to wildlife. And as we worked with the agencies, we were able to, to work through some of those concerns. And um, as Matt said, you know, kind of that Badlands area was kind of the key area of concern. It's about an eight mile stretch. Um, so south, south of the river there, um, south of the park, there's actually, there'll be a series of technically three wildlife crossings. On the bottom left, um, Long X Bridge will actually serve as a wildlife crossing. And kind of see the gaps underneath on each side of the river that'll function to help move wildlife through. And then the recently constructed um, underpass structure geared towards bighorn sheep obviously is going to uh, help move other animals through that as well. That has just been constructed. There'll be a fencing project coming up later this summer, uh, early fall, where we're going to install some fencing to tie into it. Um, and then there'll be some jump outs um, built as well. So if animal does get trapped on the highway, they have a way to get off the roadway safely. Um, looking into the future, there will be another underpass structure um, built about two miles south of the existing one. Um, that'll be geared towards more towards mule deer and other small um, animals that are in the area, mountain lions, coyotes, things like that. Um, so that'll also have fencing built with it as, as that segment gets built. And then also as we build that southern segment and get into the design, be looking at reevaluating the pronghorn um, as they, they have a pretty good population south south of uh, 
Little Missouri as you get into the prairie and uh, agriculture areas. So that is uh, about three and a half years and or, or more of <laughs> studies wrapped into five minutes regarding wildlife, but um, that's kind of what we came up with for impacts to wildlife and that's all I have. Next, we'll be talking about the design aspects of the project. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Um, again, I encourage everyone, if you have any questions, to please put them in the Q&A as we go through these slides and we'll be addressing all of them at the end. So next up, we have Matt Curley. Matt Curley is an engineer for the NDDOT in the bridge structural management section and has previously worked in the geotechnical section for 12 years. Matt's served at the NDDOT Geotechnical Liaison for the US 85 Corridor Study, as well as the Long X Bridge Reconstruction Project. Matt? Good afternoon. I hope you guys can all see my slides, but uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the geotechnical aspects of the US 85 Project, particularly in the area of the Badlands near the Little Missouri River. Let's see. There we go. In this slide, we see the geologic map provided by the North Dakota Geological Survey that shows in the pink areas all the mapped landslide features that go through this corridor. As you can see, the current US 85 alignment goes right through several of these mapped landslide areas. So there's quite a bit of history with instability in this area of the state. Uh, here's a picture back from 2002, about a mile south of the Long X Bridge, showing signs of instability. Uh, the roadway is cracking and deteriorating and in imminent danger of failing. Here in this slide, you can see the emergency remedial action that was taken to fix the instability in this area. A large earthwork operation was conducted and the embankment was then rebuilt with layers of geosynthetic fabric to reinforce the reconstructed roadway embankment. The steep back slopes, erodibility of the soils, and the lack of vegetation are also of concern. Here we can see one of the numerous back slope failures that have occurred south of the Long X Bridge. Here we see one of these back slope failures occurring, and obviously, as the material slumps down, it can get into the roadway, uh, causing a safety concern for the traveling public. Uh, just north of the Long X Bridge is an area that is often referred to as the Horseshoe Bend. You can see here in the red, the original alignment of the US 85. This alignment was abandoned in the 1980s due to numerous instability issues that occurred over time. The area shown here is a large embankment fill that was constructed during the realignment of the Horseshoe Bend area. And back in around 2011, the west end slope of this embankment began to fail. Here you can see a couple of pictures that show the shallow failure that occurred and eventually made its way up into the paved roadway surface. The slide was repaired by late 2011. The alignment of US 85 was pushed slightly to the east of the failure and the west end slope was regraded and flattened. As of today, there is still an active instability issues occurring in the Horseshoe Bend area. The top circle shows a larger back slope failure that has been very active over the past 10 years or so. It causes issues with drainage as material slumps continuously down the back slope and blocks the ditch. The two circles below the below show areas of roadway distress. Instrumentation of this large embankment fill indicate that it's moving southwestward towards the National Park. So with knowing that this area around the Little Missouri River has large issues with in instability, uh, during the development of the US 85 ES and feasibility study, a large geotechnical program was developed. Map here shows all the locations where borings were conducted. In several of these borings, instrumentation such as inclinometers as well as piezometers were installed. This was done to give an idea of local groundwater conditions as well as to let us know if any of these mapped landslides were still active. Another geotechnical program was developed during the design of the Long X Bridge. A particular note was how we were going to handle the landslide that is present on the south side of the Little Missouri River. As you can see here, several borings were conducted with instrumentation installed. The green arrows show the direction of movement in the ground that was detected during the study. 
it was apparent that the south abutment of the new Long X Bridge is going to be placed on an active landslide area, and this would have, fat, have to be factored into the design. In order to remediate these issues, the south abutment was placed on a series of eight foot diameter drilled shafts at a depth of about around 120 feet. The abutment was then anchored in place using a series of ground anchors to resist the lateral movement of the abutment caused by the landslide forces. Here we see the magnitude of the size of the drilled shafts being installed. Also on the right is a picture of the ground anchor operation. That particular picture shows the sacrificial anchor installation, which was used to verify the capacity of the anchor in the ground. Next week, we'll go into further geotechnical discussion on the Long X Bridge as we will be presenting on that topic. Switching now to the investigation for the wildlife crossing. Two borings were performed to assist in providing the geotechnical properties for the design of the wildlife structure itself. Instrumentation was installed on the west side to ensure that we're not going to be building on an active landslide area which could damage the structure in the future. Moving on to the back to the Horseshoe Bend embankment area, a uh, model was created by one of our consultants when we were looking into how to remediate this. As you can see here, it's a very large slide, about 500 feet in width, and depths right around 80 feet is where the slide was occurring. This summer, a project will be built to stabilize this landslide. Here we see a combination of drilled shafts and ground anchors that will be built to stabilize it. It'll all be tied together with using a concrete cap beam across the top. Now going back and talking about that large uh, backslope failure just to the northeast of here, uh, it was a little bit of a challenge to uh, perform any sort of geotechnical investigation out there. As you can see, we actually had a hot helicopter flying a drill rig onto the backslope here to get information. So that provided us with information for that backslope failure up there, which turned out to be a fairly shallow so we put together a geologic map of this location. And as we move forward into the future, as the four landing of US 85 progresses, we'll address uh, fixing that backslope failure in the future. Uh, this final slide here just shows a, how a combination of excavation and installation of drilled in horizontal drains can be used to stabilize that backslope. So now we'll move on to dust and wing. He'll talk a little bit about the Long X Bridge design features. Thank you, Matt. Dustin Wing works in the bridge division of the NDDOT. He has been with the DOT for 17 years and has been part of the department's bridge division for the last 15 years. Dustin's role in the project was plan preparation and design. Floor is yours, Dustin. Thanks, Megan. Uh, like Megan said, I worked on the design of the Long X Bridge. Three bridge alternatives were explored during the EIS process, but by the time that I started working on the project, option three had pretty much been selected, which was to remove the existing Long X Bridge and replace it with a new four lane structure. We were initially considering two structure types, a steel plate girder bridge and a pre-stressed concrete girder bridge. We did a cost analysis between the two structure types and found that the steel alternative would be more than $3 million more than the co concrete alternative. We typically find that the steel alternatives become more competitive as the cost of a pure substructure increases. Since the steel alternative with the ability to span longer distances would allow us to build fewer piers. In the case of the Long X Bridge, where the pier, river piers cost around $1.2 million each, we didn't see a span arrangement where we could make up the projected cost differences between the two, so we proceeded in design of the concrete alternative only. The bridge width had been predetermined to be around 85 feet wide with four lanes, 10 foot outside shoulders, six foot median shoulders, and a median barrier. While the, while the replacement bridge was originally planned to be a six span, 950 foot or so bridge, a unique set of site circumstances steered us to reduce the bridge length to 790 feet and get rid of one of the spans. 
As Matt just discussed, the geotechnical studies found evidence of large active landslides on the south end of the Long X Bridge. You can also see there is a history of this type of activity from the existing bridge details. On this slide, there is a short span off the south end of the truss that could be adjusted as movements occurred. The details for this span appear to show allowances for up to 32 inches of adjustment on this auxiliary span if movement were to occur. Although no measurable amount of movement had ever occurred on the existing structure from landslide activity, the North Dakota DOT elected to provide landslide mitigation measures on the new structure, given the evidence and history of an active slide. The design concept was to provide an abutment that could withstand the forces of an active landslide flowing around it, with no intention of actually restraining the landslide itself. We were given a geotechnical recommendation of integrating our south bridge abutment with a system of drilled shafts and ground anchors. Bridge division's responsibility was to design the drilled shafts for the given landslide loading and the abutments for the given ground anchor loading. I believe around this point in time in the design, some new information came about which shifted the footprint of the active landslide further to the north. This shift put our first pier, what we would call Pier 2, within the influence of the active landslide, and countermeasures were now being looked at for this pier as well. Now, if you take a look at the areas highlighted in red, you can gather that this is not a very productive use of a bridge span from a typical perspective because of the minimal, minimal freeboard. Its function was to increase slope stability on the existing long X structure. Since our structure took a different approach than the existing structure on how to handle landslide activity, we began asking the question whether or not we too had to provide this additional length of bridge. If we shifted the beginning of our bridge 160 feet to the north, our first bridge pier would no longer be within the influence of the landslide. The environmental, geotechnical, and hydraulic aspects of this change were cleared, and we proceeded with this shortened option. We designed the bridge to the AASHTO LRFD bridge design specifications in Chapter 4 of the North Dakota DOT Design Manual. One of the first steps in designing a bridge is determining the bridge loading. The structure was designed to carry its own self-weight, vehicle traffic, water, ice, soil, and wind loading according to the LRFD specifications. The vehicle traffic loading used was HL93 loading, which is a combination of a couple different trucks, one of which is shown on this slide, moving across the bridge and a coincident uniform lane load of 640 pounds per foot spread longitudinally along the bridge length to produce the largest reaction forces within the structure. Given the 80 foot clear roadway width of the Long X Bridge, it was designed for six lanes of this HL93 loading. If you're like me, you might have a hard time visualizing what a 640 pound per foot lane load looks like. I thought the best way for us as a group to visualize this would be to compare it to a vehicle common to us all. Considering this is the North Dakota DOT CPD conference, I thought that vehicle might be the infamous van we've all come to hear so much about over the years. I'm not sure if I have all the details correct on this, but a 2000s era Chrysler minivan, bumper to bumper across our bridge, would come in at around 270 pounds per foot. I think that should set your mind at ease if you end, ever end up stuck on a bridge with a bunch of minivans. One thing to keep in mind when designing any structure is that more loading applied does not necessarily produce the highest forces. For example, when designing this three span bridge shown at the bottom of the slide, it would be easy to assume that it would be safe to apply the 640 pounds per foot lane load across the length of the whole bridge and call it good, like it's shown on the left picture. But if you did that, you'd be missing a controlling load case, the one shown on the right, where you get greater design forces at the pier when two thirds of the bridge is loaded. This same concept applies with the number of lanes you're designing your structure for, because depending on what you're looking at, you may get greater forces from one lane of traffic than you want from six. 
It is important to sit down and brainstorm all the potential load case combinations the structure may see over time and how their structure responds to each of them and also how it responds to the different combinations of them. The next thing we are going to talk about is the beam design for this project and touch on one of the key takeaways. Pre-stressed concrete is used to control cracking and deflections in concrete beams. It does not increase the ultimate strength of the beam. We all know concrete likes to crack under stress from tension. So the idea with pre-stressing is to construct the beam with locked in compressive stresses, which counteract the tensile stresses in the bottom of the beam from loading. This in theory can provide a crack free cr concrete beam during its expected loading. This reduced cracking looks better, protects the reinforcing, and also improves the deflection characteristics of the beam, since the full beam cross section can be considered for de deflection calculations. For long span bridges, this has a huge effect. I ran some quick numbers on the long X beams, and I found that if I assumed crack section properties for calculations, the deflections from the beam self weight and weight of bridge deck alone would have increased by approximately eight inches at the midpoint of the beam. This essentially makes a conventionally reinforced concrete beam spanning this distance unfeasible. The basic design process is that we have to determine how many pre-stressing strands are required to lock in an enough initial compressive stress in the beam to prevent cracking in the lower flange under expected loading. Once we have the number of strands, we need to make sure we are not overloading the beam in compression from the forces in the strands. Concrete is strong in compression, but it does have its limits. If we find compression to be an issue, we use methods such as increasing concrete, concrete strength, debonding, and draping of strands to mitigate. The span arrangements we were proposing require 81 inch I beams at 156 feet long. 81-inch pre-stressed beams have not been used often over the years by the North Dakota DOT. And I'm only aware of the North one North Dakota DOT bridge with pre-stressed concrete girders longer than 156 feet. This made it important for us to reach out to the industry to see if they had any issues with fabricating or shipping our proposed beams. It turned out that transportation of the beams from the fabrication yard to the project was one of the controlling aspects of the beam design due to the lateral instability of the beams. In order to transport the beams safely without damage, additional concrete strength and strands in the top flange of the beam were provided by Forterra who manufactured the beams. The major takeaway was that from our perspective, where we don't usually look at stresses from transportation, the bridge could have easily been built with one less beam line. If we would have proceeded in that way, we may have had some serious issues when we found out no one could have produced and delivered such a beam. The rest of the bridge was fairly standard practice and for the interest of time, I'm going to bring things to a conclusion. I just wanted to touch on a few interesting things from the bridge design perspective. One thing I should also mention is that is the bridge design is only a small portion of bridge division's contribution to a new structure. A number of us in our division play some part throughout this process, whether it be preliminary engineering and hydraulics, plan development, oversight, construction support, or structural management items such as load rating and initial inspections. <clears throat> I have to say, it kind of seems fitting that Brian followed this up with a presentation on the wildlife crossing structure. It kind of parallels a story I believe I heard from Roger, but they would get visitors to the project site and he would show them around the bridge first. You know, him being kind of proud of the work they had done on the bridge and all. He really wanted to show them all the interesting aspects of the bridge and how, how well it was coming along. And after a while, they would all be like, yeah, Roger, this is great and all, but can we please see the wildlife crossing now? So, before we start getting those same questions in chat, I better pass things back over to Megan. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Next up is Brian Rashke. Brian Rashke has been employed with the North Dakota Department of Transportation for over 26 years, of which the last 23 years he has worked in the bridge division's design section. Brian's role in this project 
was the plan preparation, specification writing, and design, and working drawing review for the wildlife crossing structure. Brian? Thanks, Megan. Good afternoon, everyone. I will first describe requirements of the wildlife crossing and what went into some of the decisions that were made. Plans and specifications of the wildlife crossing structure will be shown, including plan details and the special provision that was written for this project. Lastly, I will go over the review of the contractor's submitted design and working drawings for the wild Christ, wildlife crossing structure. The reason this project included a wildlife crossing came from the North Dakota Game and Fish. They requested a 40 foot by 15 foot minimum clear opening window for a wildlife trail crossing US 85. This opening size was determined to be appropriate for bighorn sheep. The location chosen was one half mile south of the Little Missouri River, which was a known location for bighorn sheep crossing US 85. A location was chosen where this structure is a wildlife crossing only, not a highway water crossing. A buried structure with a link extending outside the clear zone over a bridge was chosen to so eliminate any railing or guardrail, guardrail for safety and maintenance reasons. An overhead bridge carrying wildlife was not considered due to vertical clearance concerns. This sketch shown here is from the plans which showed a buried precast concrete arch bridge. This arch section provided a 15 foot clear height and a 60 foot span, which would pro provide the minimum 40 foot wide opening. It was detailed on a deep foundation, including each pile with cast in place concrete footings. A deep foundation with driven pile was specified to support the arch bridge due to settlement concerns in this area. The elevation view shows a super roadway over the arch bridge with about eight and a half feet of fill above the arch crown at the roadway edge on the high side. The buried structure was designed for a maximum of 11 feet of fill, which included eight feet plus of fill and an additional two feet for future grading. It was also designed for a minimum of two feet of fill and a minimum of four feet of fill was to be provided at the roadway edge on the low side. Plan view of the structure detailed a length of 148 feet where it was assumed to have 37 four foot precast sections. The precast arch segments were to be installed in two phases with the east side being phase one. Most of the construction specifications for the buried bridge came from the special provision that was written by technical services of the ETS division. I will highlight some of the key components in special provision 74514, which had a very lengthy, lengthy title of precast reinforced concrete three-sided arch top buried bridge. The contractor was to design load rate fabricate and erect a precast arch structure with head walls and wing walls. The head walls and wing walls could consist of a mechanically stabilized earth or MSC wall with block facing. They could also consist of precast concrete or cast in place concrete retaining walls. The contractor was to design a deep foundation using driven steel H pile and cast in place footings to support the arch segments. The engineer of record required five years experience in the design of precast concrete arch soil interaction structures. Design was to follow the eighth edition of AASHTO's load and resistance factor design bridge design specifications and applicable sections of the DOT's design manual. The acceptable buried arch structure systems or approved equivalent and their qualified design companies were listed in the SP. They were Conspan or Bebo Bridge from Contact Engineered Solutions, Porterra Arch Bridge, and Echo Span Arch System from Pretech -Pre Group. Some of the material specifications in the SP were to use Portland cement meeting Ashto M85 Type 5 
for high sulfate resistance and consisting of 25 to 29% fly ash. Minimum design strengths of 5,000 PSI for precast elements and 3,000 PSI for cast in place items were required. All joints were to have bituminous sealant and waterproof membrane applied to them. And class 5 aerate was to be used for the foundation fill. After the contract was awarded, we reviewed the contractor's design and working drawings. The arch structure was, des was designed by the subcontractor Contact Engineer Solutions. They used their precast twin leaf Beeble Bridge concrete arch system design, which has a 60 foot span and an 18 foot rise. Contact's foundation design consisted of a concrete footing with 80 HP 14 by 89 steel piling in two rows under each arch leg. They used culvert analysis and design software, or CANDI, for the arch soil interaction analysis. A minimum design strength of 6,000 PSI was needed for the contractor to, contractor's design of the precast sections and 5,000 PSI for the cast in place footings. The arch segments were fabricated by Forterra at their Rapid City plant. The precast arches consisted of a half arch segments with a centerline jo crown joint and each segment weighed 20.4 tons. Comparing to what was detailed in our plans, the actual length was 150 feet consisting of 25 six foot precast sections or 50 half arch segments. 15 sections or 30 half arch segments were installed for a distance of 90 feet during phase one. The head walls and wing walls were Keystone MSC retaining wall system, which included modular blocks. A control, a control joint was placed at the junction of the head wall and wing wall to handle the differential settlement. Jeff Wrench will now go over the roadway design for the project. Thank you. Brian, as Brian said, Jeff Wrench is our next presenter. He graduated from NDSU in 2001 with a degree in civil engineering. He began his employment with the NDDOT in 2012 and has been working as a transportation engineer in the design division since joining the DOT. Jeff. Thanks, Megan. Um, so I'll be I was responsible for the highway design portion of the Long X Bridge project and I'll highlight some of the work that went into developing the plans. Uh, the proposed project was designed in accordance with DOT guidelines for newer reconstruction projects. Design speed of 65 miles per hour was used for the design, which meets our standard practice for rural, multi-lane, divided, flush median highways. In order to maintain traffic on the existing bridge during construction, the proposed alignment was offset 85 feet to the east of the existing bridge. An alignment alternative to the west of the existing bridge was also explored, but was eliminated due to concerns about a landslide mass located southwest of the bridge. The length of the project was driven by the desire to tie the proposed four lane section into existing climbing lanes located north and south of the bridge. The resulting total project length was approximately 1.8 miles. Within this project length, the DOT wished to utilize as much of the existing pavement structure as possible, so the project consists of a mix of reconstruction and also widening from the existing pavement. The proposed roadway section is a divided flush median section with a 20 foot median width and eight foot shoulders. Due to constraints near the Theodore Roosevelt National Park, the median width was reduced to 14 and a half feet from the Long X Bridge to the park entrance. In the areas of widening, a vertical cut was used to remove a portion of the existing pavement and the new asphalt and base were constructed from this vertical edge. A final two inch asphalt lift will extend across the entire roadway width, including the new and the existing pavement. There is one unique segment located north of the Long X Bridge. In this area, a subcut was completed in 2013 and approximately three and a half feet of aggregate base had been placed as part of that project. Materials and research was asked that we match the existing base depth in this section. To minimize the volume of base we'd have to place, material was removed to expose the existing base at a four to one slope and the new base material was placed with a three to one slough slope. Embankment material was then placed over the base slough to construct the six to one four slope, 
and edge drains were provided in the base course to help with the drainage. In this view, you can see the 3D alignments used to develop the project model. New permanent right-of-way was required for the project. The majority of the right-of-way acquired was from privately owned land. The right-of-way was also obtained from U.S. Forest Service lands to the east of Highway 85, south of Long X Bridge. In addition to the permanent right-of-way, temporary easements were secured near the bridge to provide areas for staging of materials and equipment. A phasing plan was developed during design so that traffic could be maintained on a paved roadway surface at all times during construction. The first phase called for a temporary bypass to be constructed to the west of the proposed wildlife crossing and for US 85 to be widened to the west of the existing roadway near the north end of the project. So Jeff, traffic I think shift you lost your uh, PowerPoint. Can you reshare it for us? Yep, sure can. Is it back up now? Yep, thank you. Okay. Um, when the traffic was shifted west using the temporary bypass on the west side of the highway, um, still using the existing bridge and the highway, work could be completed on the new bridge substructures and the east half of the wildlife crossing could be constructed. In this phase, roadway work could also be completed on the east half of the proposed alignment of Highway 85. When the east half of the wildlife crossing was completed, traffic was shifted to the new roadway over the wildlife crossing and construction could be completed on the west half of the wildlife structure. Bridge construction was still ongoing, so traffic was shifted back to the existing roadway just south of the Long X Bridge to continue to cross the existing bridge. When the new bridge was fully completed last fall, head-to-head -head traffic was shifted onto the east half of the new bridge and two lanes of traffic were carried over the winter on the newly constructed roadway and bridge. Demolition of the old Long X Bridge was completed over the winter and in the final phase of the project, the remaining portions of the roadway will be constructed. In this view, you can also see the new access that was provided to a privately owned ranch located just southeast of the bridge. Working with the landowner, the DOT was able to remove the access from Highway 85 and provide the owners with access to their property from Long X Road. This was a benefit to both the DOT and to the property owners who will no longer have oil field traffic driving through their yard to access, access Long X Road to the east of Highway 85. When the project wraps up this summer, we'll be left with a four lane segment of US 85 crossing the Little Missouri River. In this final slide is a video showing a drive through view of the completed project. At the south end of the project, the southbound lanes tie into the existing climbing lanes and the single northbound lane of traffic transitions to two lanes. The U.S. Forest Service, Service easement is area is depicted by the green line on the right, and you can see the grading for the wildlife crossing beneath Highway 85. Regrading of Long X Road and the new, Long, the new ranch access provided from Long X Road are shown on the right side of the screen. At the bridge, the flush median width is reduced from 20 feet to 14 and a half feet across the bridge, and this reduced median width is carried north to the entrance of Teddy Roosevelt National Park. Several of the approaches north of the bridge had to be regraded to meet current DOT standards for a maximum approach grade of 10% and to provide an adequate storage platform at the top of the approach. A left turn lane was provided for northbound traffic to turn west into the National Park, and you can also see how the second southbound lane was introduced at the intersection with the park entrance road. A right turn lane was provided for southbound traffic to turn into the park, and both northbound lane travel lanes continue and tie into the existing travel lane and climbing lane north of the project. And I'll turn it back to Megan now to introduce the next presenters. Thank you, Jeff. Our next presenters are Dan and Roger, Dan Schneider and Roger Hilly from AECOM. AECOM was selected as the construction engineering consultant for this project. Dan Schneider is a project engineer and has over 30 years of experience in managing construction projects in North Dakota and in Wisconsin. Roger Hilly was the lead structural inspector and has been involved with the road and bridge construction projects for over 40 years. Uh, Dan will be in this part of, portion of the presentation. 
Uh, thanks, Megan. Um, I guess we stick everybody. Are my slides up? Yep, I can see them. OK, uh, just to start with the construction. Um, Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, let me give me a second. OK, uh, just construction portion of it. Uh, presentation, uh, just quick project overview of it. Uh, we went through a lot of the, the limits and everything. The contract date uh, was June 10th, 2019. Start date of construction was July 29th, 2019. Uh, hope to be done completion date uh, July 15th. 2021. The original contract amount was just short of $34 million. Contractor is Ames Construction out of Burnsville, Minnesota. The construction team was led by AECOM uh, Civil Science, did the uh, survey, all the survey for the project, and Braun Intertech did all the uh, uh, materials testing. Quick order of sequencing for the project uh, started in 2019 with uh, riding, widening the roadway. Uh, on the north side to allow traffic uh, to shift a little bit to the west. Uh, began construction along the X Bridge and started construction a temporary bypass for at the wildlife crossing so we could construct, construct the east half of the wildlife crossing. After temporary bypass was completed, we moved the traffic onto it, constructed the east portion of wildlife crossing and continued with the bridge construction. Uh, construction once the uh, east portion of the wildlife crossing was completed, we pushed push traffic back onto onto over the east portion of the wildlife crossing so we could construct the west portion of the wildlife crossing. That occurred in uh, early 2020. Uh, completed construction along X Bridge um, and started and then worked on it to uh, route traffic over the east half of the of the Long X Bridge after it was completed. Uh, after completion of the bridge and we got traffic switched to the east half, we removed the existing bridge uh, through demolition and as was mentioned, salvaging for uh, uh, the south half of the bridge for a uh, portion of the bridge for for route to uh, as a historic and reconstruction. I uh, hope to complete. We will complete the roadway and and route traffic to the new constructed bridge and roadway. Uh, as I said, hope it should be by July 15th of this year. Uh, as was mentioned, we had a lot of environmental commitments on this job. Uh, here's listing a few of them uh, through the times. There was 47 environmental commitments listed through the plans and specials and specs on this job. Uh, included uh, noxious weed surveys, uh, equipment hygiene, fire prevention pr provisions, noise provisions, start times uh, due to the national park um, adjacent to the project, uh, causeway construction, aquatic nuisance, cultural resource preservation um, with paleontologists and quite a few sensitive plant species and um, bird uh, bird surveys uh, to for with limitations on if we found uh, lek grouse close by uh, start times and and for the lek grouse. Uh, this slide is just a couple more uh, going through uh, the environmental commitments. Uh, Pre-construction of the job, just a picture of the existing bridge. The existing bridge, as was mentioned, was 970 feet long by 33 feet wide, constructed in 1958 and 1959, uh, painted in the 80s. That's the way we started. Every project with expansion starts with good e what, looking at erosion control uh, and making sure you get your preliminary erosion control all in sight, all in order uh, before you start any excavation. And these are just a couple pictures of putting up some preliminary uh, silt fence control uh, up north of the uh, National Park. With that, we could start topsoil removal and excavation on the project. Um, started excavation for the expansion of four lanes. Uh, common excavation was 152,500 cubic yards of common. 52,000 cubic yards of borrow when we're all done with the project and approximately 5,500 cubic yards of 
of waste excavation. Uh, while we're excavating, we're required to have a paleontologist on site. Uh, paleo findings, as you can see, we've just got a few pictures here of the paleo findings. Uh, bones on the, on the right, uh, a lot of this was from Latifron and Antiquus bones. Uh, the paleontologist stated that a lot of these bones he estimated from 5,000 to 15,000 years old. And we did some, find some plant fossils that uh, he estimated maybe about 50 million years old on the project. So I think probably he, everybody kind of thought I, everybody kind of agreed that we found a little bit more than, that, than they had thought we would uh, when we excavated. Uh, construction also included uh, concrete pipe extensions uh, for widening the road and a jack and bore pipe, uh, 48 inch, 150 foot long steel, steel pipe south of the bridge. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Roger who's going to go through construction of the uh, bridge and the wildlife crossing. Thank you, Dan. Um, uh, the first slide I have is a uh, slide that uh, Dustin Wing went, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> went over earlier, and it just shows the 790 foot by 85 foot structure, clean design, basic and economical, uh, again, fairly straightforward, except for abutment uh, number one. Next slide. Um, the, the, here are some pictures of the drill shafts at abutment one. Again, they're about eight foot in diameter, half inch wide, um, 116 feet deep, each filled with 220 yards, roughly 220 yards of concrete. Um, you can see that uh, they went in in two sections, all these sections uh, in, in two sections, and each of the welds were ultrasonically tested. Um, they were oscillated in, you can see it in the center slide there, they're oscillated in and then excavated from within. Dan, if you click that, we should a video. Yeah, hang on, George. Okay, we can we can go on. At in, at any rate, it's just excavated from inside the can, and and then the can is uh, oscillated down. Next slide. Here we can see the reinforcing steel that uh, went into the uh, drilled shafts uh, casings. Each, uh, each one, each cage is uh, about 30,000 pounds of pre-tied steel, uh, two crane pick and engineered, so there's six pick points on each. And as they go down into that casing, you'll see on the right slide there, there are little uh, spacers or just little plastic wheels to keep the reinforcing steel spaced away from the casing. And uh, here we go to the ground anchors and here we go to the ground anchors. Um, there are 15 anchors as shown in the center slide. Um, they go from 25, uh, one will be 25 degrees and then the next would be 30 degrees, two of which are instrumented with strain gauges. They go back in, be, some of them 120 to, and some of them at 140 foot long. Factor design of 250 kips and we locked them all off right at 185 kips. Um, and the, the process is very, very mechanized. It, uh, it's um, amazing to, to see the subcon the subcontract subcontract was Malcolm um, construction and they pretty much knew what they were doing. So 
Next slide. Just a little bit more about the ground anchor. Here you'll see you, the tails are being cut off and the lock off put, put in place on the ground anchors. And then of course the instrumentation on the right slide. So you have 24 seven movement of not only the strain gauges in the um, ground anchors, but there are also instrumentation in the casings in the drill shafts as well that will show any variance in plumb of those shafts. So a lot of, a lot of time and effort into the uh, abutment one. Uh, the rest of the bridge as Dustin Wing indicated earlier is fairly basic. Um, here's a, a few pictures of the piling. 20,000 feet of piling on this project. They ranging from 10 by 42s to 14 by 102s. Um, pile points were required on the piers, pier piling, but the contractor elected to use pile points on all of the piling. So all of the pile had welded on pile points. Next slide. Just a little bit about cofferdam construction. One of the, um, we think one of the milestones of the project is to get uh, the high risk areas uh, completed. And certainly getting out of the river with these cofferdams was, uh, was a major milestone. Um, the, there's, uh, on, the, on the left slide, you'll see wintertime construction and we're about 20 feet below the bottom of the river here and you can see the ice coming in from the coffer dam. Most of the sheets were about 40, 42 foot um, so they were uh, engineered to be about 15 or 18 feet embedded. In the center slide you can see the footings in place and uh, reinforcing steel. I think those um, uh, those footings were a couple hundred yards, if I remember correctly. On the right side, you can see placing and the pipes coming in with heat. Again, everything was covered. This is winter construction, so everything was covered and then just uncovered during the placement of the concrete. And, and then curing temperatures were monitored. Next slide. A reinforcing steel, a uh, million and a half pounds of reinforcing steel on the structure. Uh, on the left, you'll see one of the stems of, this will be Pier 5, Pier 4, Pier 4, I guess. And you can see in the background there the um, architectural finish. It's a form liner that will for, will uh, place the architectural finish on the pier stems. Uh, another picture of abutment number one with the steel. You can see the one of the drilled shafts is outside of the pier itself uh, for monitoring purposes. And on the right you can see some mechanical connections of the reinforcing steel. Again, from the bottom of these, uh, of uh, the higher piers, it's about 50 feet from the bottom to the cap, top of the cap where the, where the beams will sit. So uh, the contractor, well, actually Dustin Wing designed these, um, um, mechanical splices for the vertical reinforcing steel. Next slide. And placing of the concrete. Um, overall, the project had 7,500 cubic yards of concrete. Uh, 500 cubic yards in abutment one. Uh, again, that, that was the anomaly of this project, the rest of it being 
more straightforward. Um, peer three was the highest peer and that peer, if you included the footing with it, was 650 yards. The superstructure 25 was 2,500 cubic yards. So a lot of truckloads and um, although Mother Nature treated us fairly well in terms of uh, construct constructability weather, if you will, there was always some mud coming in. The pictures that you see are um, don't depict some of the bigger challenges when we had some rain on the project. I should I should mention the center center slide here is showing footings at the wildlife crossing. The the left showing driving piling in one of the piers while we're pouring concrete in uh, one of the other pier footings. Next slide, Dan. Here's the form liner on Pier 5. Um, there's 10,000 square feet of form liner on this project. Uh, quite a challenge in terms of workmanship, not only to place the form liner, but to stain it up afterwards, as you'll see. And then, of course, on the top of the bridge, architecturally, we've got surface definish on all of those areas. Um, Next slide, Dan. Here's some substructure construction. Um, the project was started in, you know, I suppose it was October, early October, and substructure construction was completed in June of 2020. And uh, on the left, you'll, you'll just see one of the piers, that would be Pier 3 going up there. And Pier 4 in the middle, and then of course uh, on the right slide here, we're placing the pads uh, for the, the bearing pads for the beams. Um, next slide, a little bit about the architectural finish. Um, it's uh, again 10,000 square feet. The subcontractor provided some very, very um, talented craftsmen that did this work. And um, before before the construction can start, you can see that there, there's a test panel. And so the test panel was distributed or and pictures distributed to the bridge office and the district to make sure that the pattern and the colors were appropriate and then you go into the staining process in the middle. You'll see where the craftsmen are working there. They, they're uh, outlining separately each stone. They have a pattern in their pocket so they don't have repetitiveness showing up in, in the uh, um, process. And then after it's all colored like that, they'll put a uh, just a wash coat. They'll spray a wash coat on it that stains it all to that brown color you see at the top. And then, of course, on the right slide there, you're going to see the finished finished product. Um, next slide. Next thing we've got to do is put some beams on. And as uh, Dustin talked about earlier, there. Uh, 75 ton a piece and 156 feet long. Uh, the left slide depicting placing them on span five and uh, one crane on each side and then walking them in. On the right slide, you can see that uh, the transport vehicle, uh, 16 axles on that truck, so just providing access, uh, access roads to get those long trucks in and keeping them level uh, was a challenge for the contractor. Uh, again, there was 60 girders, each 75 ton. So just the weight of the girders themselves on this job was 4,500 ton. Uh, next slide, Dan. Next slide here is just a, picture of setting the most challenging span, which was over the river. 
and uh, over the Little Missouri River, the contractor decided to do it without a work bridge in that area because one of the environmental commitments was to keep at least 50 feet of the river open at all times. So they had a 550 ton crane on one side of the river and a 350 ton crane on the other side. They passed the beam over the river and then um, uh, adjusted the picks of each crane. And in the center, the left, you can see the 500 ton or 550 ton crane. And on the right, you can see the bearing pads being already placed and being ready for placement of the beams. Next slide. And deck placement or superstructure placement. Again, there were 2,500 cubic yards in the deck and rails placed in three separate segments. Um, the first uh, on the left, that's the first uh, placement and of course start early, early in the day. The first placement of uh, roughly 800 cubic yards took about 14 hours. And after that, we had some conferences with the contractor. The contractor brought in additional pumps so the last uh, time we poured or the last segment that was poured was done uh, again about that same 800 cubic yards in about eight hours. So uh, just like uh, I guess just like any other task that's performed in construction as you go through it uh, you make some adjustments to make it a uh, little bit better and easier for the folks that are doing the work. Um, and on the right, you can see the finished product. Everything is wet cured on this job. There are no curing compounds. Everything was wet cured. All the substructure and superstructure concrete wet cured. And the last uh, process that happens, of course, is grinding and grooving the deck. Uh, the rag was good to start with, but it's uh, profilographed. And so grinding of the deck was required as well as grooving. The left photo there you'll see is the grinding process with slurry uh, containment and then the grooving process, of course, and then on the right, the completed deck and the um, attenuating attenuator device on each end. And that is, I believe, all I have, Dan, unless there's one more. Oh, yeah, we should talk about that. Would, um, pretty much everyone, as Dustin said, I, I like bridges a lot, so I spent a lot of time on the bridge, but most people came out wanted to see the wildlife crossing, so here it is. I'm sure I've got at least 100 slides of that, but the as Brian talked about earlier, these came in in 20 ton chunks. Uh, each, each half section was 20 ton. And you see they're rigged up as shown there and then in the center photo the two cranes walk them in together and then uh, you have a crown joint there that's bolted together and then of course poured in concrete later and um, as brian said earlier in the design 5000 psi concrete in the footings 6000 psi concrete in the crown joint and the sections themselves. Phase one, uh, there were there are 25 separate sections or 50 pieces, if you will, and there was 15 placed in phase one and the last in phase the last 10 in phase two. Next slide, please. And uh, of course, uh, Mother Nature has got to have a little bit of rain here and there and so on the left you can see the piling after the piling was placed and they were ready to start forming we had a little rain and if you look in the background of that picture you can see the sill fence that's erected there to um, lim limit any off-site erosion 
or siltation. And it only took them a couple of days to dry it out and pour the puddings with the 6,000, 5,000 PSI mix. And then uh, on the right, it's the first parts of phase two. And you can see um, between phase one and phase two, the contractor erected a MS, a temporary MSC uh, mechanically stabilized earth wall um, to provide for the traffic uh, to be moved over onto that segment. Next slide. And that's the completed uh, wildlife crossing looking, looking east. And gee, I guess I had a few more slides of the bridge than the uh, wildlife crossing. All yours, Dan. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Roger. Well, while uh, Roger was completing his bridge, uh, we had to do some roadway work so we could get traffic over the top of it. Uh, so it wasn't just a bridge over the Little Missouri River. Uh, slides just showing a little bit of uh, erosion control uh, for the slopes that was going on. Uh, had class three seed, which has a short uh, placement period from May 1st to June 15th. A uh, couple items that we had were bonded fiber matrix, turf reinforced mat, and erosion mat, um, depending on the slopes and, and where where the items, where, where we needed certain types of erosion control. Uh, just a slide showing the paving operations so we can get to the bridge on the left and then the completed bridge with traffic over the top of it on the east half of the the bridge which happened uh, in november of uh, 2020. after the bridge was completed uh, we could start and we had traffic moved over we could start demolition and salvage on the old bridge uh, the contractor mobilized to the site november 16th began operations november 17th and was completed by the uh, middle of January, so approximately uh, two months uh, to complete demolition and salvage of the bridge. Uh, salvage the south 260 feet of the bridge for for movement and, and for saving, and as was mentioned, for uh, reconstruction down by Linton. Uh, each part, each separate piece of the steel structure was taken down separately and marked for reconstruction along with uh, bolts put in bags to uh, uh, every joint to and labeled as to which joint they came off of for the reconstruction. Uh, as the salvage was started, uh, we could also do demolition on the bridge. Uh, there's a couple slides, uh, the left slide showing uh, concrete uh, that had to be removed on, on the existing bridge and right slide showing the concrete when it was all all, after all the concrete was done, the bridge after all the concrete was done. Uh, salvage of the bridge started with uh, placement, placement of cribbings uh, to hold up the salvage portion of the bridge while all the, the structural pieces were removed. Uh, that's on the left, uh, just start the, in the man lift, a couple of, of contractors going up to start removal of the bolts to disconnect the salvage portion from the demo, demo portion. And on the right was the last vertical piece uh, of the bridge uh, being lifted off. As salvage was done, the uh, bridge demolition also, you can see on the left, uh, the uh, south portion from the salvage to the first pier was demolished and over the pier was dropped, dropped down. Uh, the right picture was just showing uh, demolition of the uh, the South Pier. This is what it looked like after the demolition was complete. Uh, you can see that not all of the uh, uh, demolished steel was hauled away, but that they were working very diligently on that also during this time. Uh, bridge demolition also required demolition of the North Pier which required a coffer dam to be built uh, for so it didn't get because it was so close to the the river opening uh, the coffer dam had to be built uh, picture on the left just showing construction of the coffer dam picture in the middle showing the the pier removed to uh, elevation that was shown 
uh, that was required in the plan. And the picture on the right, just backfilling the uh, coffer dam uh, with native soils. And finally, after the bridge demolition was done, we had just clean up. They used the coffer dam to drive equipment out to demolish the bridge and for salvage purposes, that coffer dam needed to be taken out of the river, um, cleaned up, just picture on the left, showing coffer dam, or not coffer dam, excuse me, causeway removal, and picture on the right, uh, just some grading after, after all the bridge was removed and salvaged. Uh, so current status is, uh, the project remaining is, is uh, get removal of old, the ex old existing pavement and completion of the construction of the southbound lanes and pavement, uh, then complete uh, two inch overlay of the whole project uh, from south limits to north limits, permanent erosion control, signing pavement marking, uh, right of way posts and, uh, and fencing uh, remain. And with that, that concludes the construction end, and I'll turn it back over to Matt for uh, uh, for a conclusion. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, we are a few minutes over right now, so if you if you need to leave, please feel free to uh, leave. This is being recorded, so you can um, view it at a later time. Um, Matt, did you have a conclusion to give or would you like me to start with a few Q&A questions? I think it's time for questions. OK, um, the first question that we have is, will the mumble versus rumble strips as discussed in the previous presentation be implemented to minimize noise near the park? Uh, I think that's a good question and a good idea. <laughs> and so uh, I don't think that's in the in the plans now, but as that's a new technology that we're looking at, I think it's definitely worth consideration. We did do a quiet pavement noise analysis, uh, looking at different types of materials to use to reduce noise in the park. So I think this falls uh, right in line with that. So something we'll definitely need to, to follow up on. Great, another question we had is, are there other wildlife underpasses plan between Belfield and Watford City. I think, Brian, that you had that maybe shown in your slides. Are there two others shown? I think uh, Greg Schoenert talked about that a little bit, at least in the, yep, in the Badlands segment. You know, we tried to look at that as an overall crossing, wildlife crossing and uh, habitat connection type of system. So, you know, the, the main point of that is the the fencing that goes along with it. So exclusionary fencing to keep wildlife from trying to cross the road to eliminate those animal vehicle collisions and then providing those crossing spaces so they can stay connected. So that system, like Greg said, you know, includes the Long X Bridge, obviously itself, the wildlife crossing that was shown that was constructed as part of this project, as well as, you know, in the southern Badlands, an additional basically a 10 by 20 style box culvert. Those are the ones that are all kind of planned for future development. Uh, I think Greg mentioned um, as we would start development of projects further to the south, we would revisit the potential for some um, uh, wildlife crossings to kind of target uh, pronghorn. And so that's all still to be developed. So no plan. I guess the short answer is there's none planned other than those systems in the wildlife in the in the Badlands area, but still some to be uh, consulted on. OK, another question that came in was how far south has the four lane been completed? I don't know if that is as far as construction or design. Sure, I'll try to answer it holistically. Um, I think uh, what you saw here today, which included, like I said, the Long X Bridge construction and, and tying into the, there was climbing lanes going up out of the river valley in both directions. So the four lane ties into the essentially three lane sections that existed. So there's only a very short stretch, stretch there of four lanes. Um, you know, where we're, that's all that's built. Um, as we're looking to the future, like Matt um, Curly talked about, we, we've done the planning and, and design and we'll have a construction project this year for that landslide stabilization um, at the Horseshoe Bend area. And then um, we're currently working on, as a department, the, the project development of the four lane segment between Long X Bridge and Watford City. 
And that one is, like I said, we're, we're moving forward with development and we're actively pursuing some uh, grant opportunities to fund the construction for that. Uh, I think the other thing that, you know, the other, the one other piece of or project that will kind of become real in the next couple of years, <clears throat> and I think Greg mentioned was uh, partial wildlife fencing. Uh, even though Long X Bridge is built and the and the wildlife underpass was built, we didn't include any of that fencing originally because it was unknown when that four laning will happen and it's still kind of unknown because there's no uh, funding determined. So uh, a portion of that wildlife fencing from the Little Missouri River south uh, is being developed and, and planned to be built. So that's kind of all the, the active projects that are being developed, but at this time, other than the Horseshoe Bend landslide mitigation, there's there's been no funding identified to build any of it. Okay, and this question might be one we might need to follow up, follow up with with Fish and Game, but what kind of research was done to determine the size of the wildlife crossing? There's been a large amount of verified wildlife foot traffic. Being a long tunnel span to cross, I'm sure there was some coordination with wildlife folks to see what animals would be deemed safe to travel through. Just curious about the correspondence was, what the correspondence was in design of the structure. Yeah, definitely uh, a lot of a lot of work. Like Greg pointed out, there was two very detailed studies that were done as part of this project. One to identify kind of the biological side of things, like where were all the critical, I don't call it critical, it's maybe wrong word, but a lot of the, the high quality habitat areas that were on both sides of the road that the, the road would potentially split um, a lot of uh, work went into that and then identifying the animals or the species that would be targeted in those areas and then also the associated type of crossings that would be necessary uh, for those animals. So in the case of the wildlife crossing here that was built, you know, our, our main target species being bighorn sheep and bighorn sheep being very much, uh, you know, you know, their main defense me mechanism is staying on the high ground and be able to see what's going on around them. And you know, going underneath was uh, a little bit of a stretch, but uh, they, by providing an opening that was big enough to give them a sense of a sense of openness and be able to see what's going on, um, that's where we, you know, had, there's been a lot of research done, especially in Western states, um, to see what what those kind of approximate sizes. There's been some bighorn desert bighorn sheep crossings built down in Arizona, and we looked at those projects a lot. You know, they had several overpasses and several underpasses, and you know, making, based on all of that and then consulting with the agencies with, with North Dakota Game and Fish being the, the kind of the stewards of the bighorn sheep population, uh, getting input from them and kind of making a good decision with, with all those players on, on what that size would be. And as, uh, as uh, Brian pointed out, the kind of the main thing was we wanted to have that inscribed square of a 15 by 40 opening. Um, awesome, thank you. Um, are there any hiking trails within this project in the highway right away that you're aware of? Uh, no, it's not not so if, if by meaning project talking about the Long X Bridge and in the area of the north unit of the National Park. Uh, no, there is not. Um, the the trail that that is part of the project, like I said, that connects up to Watford City uh, that at least for the concept, the highway purposes is going to stop at the, about the boundary of the north unit of the park and I think the the intent is the county will develop like a trailhead there that people can can use and I think they're going to continue to try to find other um, jumping off points if you want to call it that uh, for uh, recreation biking and obviously if you're biking you're you can jump on the highway as well. Um, next question, I think a lot of people are thinking this, when is the four lane going to start being built between south of Watford City and the bridge? Yeah, uh, I don't have a good answer for that. Like I said, we are, we're hopeful, I think, as a department that that will happen soon and we are actively pursuing some, some grant opportunities to fund that and we are, you know, very active. I think we're moving, you know, we have a pretty good design done um, already. And we're looking at moving forward with some of the the utility impacts and starting to look at some of the potential for right away there. Uh, hopeful that we can have a set of plans ready to go when that funding does present itself. Um, 
one other question that just came in here. Are there any video monitoring devices installed to validate the Animal Crossing usage? Uh, the short answer is yes. And Greg Schoner probably has a little bit more current information for me, for us on that. Yeah, um, Matt, the, the, the Game and Fish does have a camera installed, but they're they're waiting to get some updated equipment to, to get kind of the, the live footage. So as the pictures are collected, they'll be automatically uploaded. Um, but right now there is a camera up there. We we we, we do have some footage or pictures of, of deer going through there. No bighorn sheep yet, but um, we, like I say we, we, uh, earlier, we don't have the fencing installed yet. So we anticipate once the fencing gets installed, you know, um, we're, we're going to get that uh, updated camera system installed and then uh, be getting some more pictures that way. But it's 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 encouraging to see the the structure being used um, right now without the fencing, though. So that that's great to see. I think the other the other thing to note too is that we do have an agreement, a formal agreement with Game and Fish for them to help monitor that crossing and then. You know, as as they monitor it too, that that's a good way. The camera will show us usage. Some of that does take some learning of the animals, even even with fencing, to to find that location, as well as then that the game and fish can help us identify if there's any like adaptive management that needs to be done to adjust some of the features. Uh, you know, to kind of help facilitate wildlife wanting to go through there. Great. Well, I know for one, I'm excited that I don't have to go down there and inspect it the old long x bridge anymore and it get hit so thank you you for building the new one um i don't see any more questions right now